Hi everyone, welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of the Sutton Program, sponsored by RS Components Grassroots. This first season will delve into the fundamental topics behind launching a rocket successfully and carrying out rocket recovery. This first episode will talk about the history of rocketry. But before we do so, you need to know what actually is a rocket. Now when I say the word rocket, you might think of something like SpaceX's Falcon Heavy or NASA's Saturn V. But in its simplest form, a rocket can be described as something that propels itself by exhausting a combusted fuel. Now this sounds rather complicated, but a simple example of an object that matches this principle is a firework, which combines a cardboard tube with gunpowder to create a basic rocket. The first recorded examples of rockets date back to the 13th century, where the Chinese used them in battles by attaching them to arrows. So that counts as a basic example of a rocket. But how does that relate to the kind of rockets that have taken us to the moon and beyond? Here's an example of a more substantial model rocket. This is GU Rocketry's Salt Air 1, our debut launcher. We'll go through each part of it and explain what it does. At the top of the rocket is the nose cone. This middle section is the body, and at the bottom are the fins. Each part of this affects the rocket's aerodynamic stability, which we will explain more in a further episode. Inside of the rocket are three extra parts, which are arguably the most important. We have the recovery system, the avionics bay, and the motor at the bottom. And with that, let's go back and talk about the history of rocketry. In the 16th century, a firework maker by the name of Johann Schmidlap created a firework capable of reaching greater heights by using smaller rockets fitted inside a larger rocket shell. This is the first example of a multi-stage rocket, which has been used for decades to take us further and further from Earth. A multi-stage rocket is a rocket that is capable of having sections break off of it once it runs out of fuel, therefore reducing the mass and allowing the rocket to reach greater heights. During the Second World War, rocket technology had advanced significantly, leading up to the creation of the V-2 rocket, which is perhaps the first example of a rocket similar to what we know today. The V-2 was created by Werner von Braun to be used against the Allies during World War II. They would bombard the Allies by adding an explosive payload to the missile and fire it across the English Channel. Inspired by the impressive capabilities of the V-2 rocket, the Soviets developed the ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, which showed that they were now capable of sending rockets across continents. Using the blueprints of the ICBM, the Soviets developed Sputnik, a rocket capable of launching a small satellite into a low Earth orbit. And on the 4th of October 1957, Sputnik 1 successfully achieved orbit, marking the first man-made satellite in space. Under pressure from the American public, the US had to re-establish themselves as a global leader in rocket technology, which led to them launching their first orbit-reaching rocket, Juno, just months later. This marked the beginning of the space race. Now both countries were trying to develop a rocket that was more complex and efficient than the other, while having the goal of keeping a human alive in the vacuum of space. The US had been taking steps in developing a human-rated spacecraft, going so far as to launch HAM, the chimpanzee, into space. But the Americans were shocked when, just a few months later, the Soviets successfully sent up Yuri Gagarin into space with the Vostok 1 spacecraft marking him the first human in orbit. The Americans had to respond to this, and 10 months later, they sent up John Glenn with the Mercury Atlas rocket. Both the Soviet and American rocket programs saw continued success in helping their astronauts achieve orbit. However, neither side could claim that they had won the space race. The big goal set by President John F. Kennedy was to land on the moon. This would require a whole new class of rocket. The Americans created the Apollo program with the Saturn V rocket, and the Soviets had a similar program running, launching the Soyuz 7 capsule on their N1 rocket. Both programs contributed greatly to advancements in many fields, such as rocket propulsion technology, flight guidance systems, structural engineering, and material science. The Americans saw success with the launch of the Apollo 11 program. The Saturn V rocket coupled with the lunar module allowed for Neil Armstrong to become the first person to set foot on the moon. The Soviets tried to replicate the American success with the N1 rocket, but it suffered catastrophic failure and was never able to achieve its goal. After the moon landings, and with the peak of the Cold War over, the Americans and the Soviets entered an era of fragile collaboration, where they felt less hindered by the need to outdo one another. The next major technological shift in rocketry was the development of the Space Shuttle, with a greater focus on reusability. The Space Shuttle could take off vertically with a rocket booster and land horizontally on a runway. The use of the Space Shuttle allowed for the creation of the International Space Station, arguably the greatest engineering achievement of our time. 
The shuttles played a critical role in the construction of the ISS, assisting in its assembly and transport in space. This was the first time any nation had tried to reuse part of a rocket, and this challenge came with setbacks. Despite the success of the ISS, the space shuttle program ended up being more expensive than originally planned. Along with being a host to both the Columbia and Challenger disasters, this program was eventually reassessed and terminated. Rocketry advancement then entered another period of stagnation, with a lack of global interest for manned spaceflight, which led to a lack of launcher development from NASA. SpaceX became the first private company in the world to successfully launch a rocket, leading to the development of Falcon 9, which is the first rocket in the world to have detachable rocket boosters that can land vertically and be reused again. This indicated just the start of private involvement in the space industry, with companies such as Blue Origin, Rocket Lab and Skyrora all aiming to promote rocketry across the globe. And so this has been a brief history of rocketry. Obviously there were many events that have taken place in this industry over the last couple of centuries that we could not cover as there's simply too much. Next time we'll delve more deeply into the fundamental physics behind rocketry. Why do rockets work the way that they do? And who are the scientists that develop the principles behind them? Once again, thank you to RS Components Grassroots for sponsoring this video. If you want to head over to designspark.com, you'll find our first article in our educational series, which aims to cover the same topics that we have covered in our episodes, for those who want to learn a little bit more about the rocketry concepts that we've covered. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next episode.